Volume Four, Chapter Four of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Four, Chapter Four if willoughby was so deeply affected by the sight of celestina the sudden shock she had received from their abrupt meeting and from his strange behaviour had on her an equally painful though a different effect that the impulse of the moment had urged him to take her hand made her hope that some remains of affection for her yet lingered in his bosom and that his former regard was rather stifled by anger than annihilated by indifference she knew that the first might be removed and that she might be restored to his friendship but that if his heart had once become quite cold towards her nothing could ever renew even that share of tenderness with which she could learn if not be happy at least to be content it was some time before she could cover from the agitation of spirits in which this unexpected interview had thrown her but when she at length became calm enough to reflect on it she determined to say nothing of having seen willoughby to lady horatia as she knew it would appear to her only a fresh instance of his unworthy treatment of her on which how severely soever she felt it she did not love to hear any comments even from her best friends with all the resolution she could collect therefore stifling her internal anguish she prepared to go with a large party in the evening to Rainla. while she was dressing for this purpose a servant brought up to her the following letter madame that a stranger and a stranger in my situation of life should address you would possibly appear to any less generous mind than yours a liberty that should be repulsed with disdain and resented by contempt but i am persuaded that you i may expect that liberal candor with which true virtue an unaffected goodness considers even those whom the generality of the world agree to condemn and despise you know madam what i have been and what i am from miss elphinstone you have probably learned what were the circumstances of my early life and mr vassiver with that sincerity which deserves to be so highly valued has told you how long i have been under his protection he has since madame expressed some fears that this information may have been prejudicial to his interest with you and at least it should be so allow me to declare to you that i know myself too well to believe for a moment that i ought to be in question where you are beloved too well to hesitate in declaring that attached as i am to mr vassiver i can never make him happy as he deserves to be no madam that happiness depends entirely on you such a passion as he feels for you i believe no other person can deserve and i know him to have so good a heart i desire his felicity so sincerely that i hazard this step in the hope of promoting it mr vassiver's generosity has left me nothing to fear for the rest of my life were it even to be a long one but i feel that a very few months will bring it to an end and i feel it without concern for thoughtless and unworthy as my conduct has been I have never found in its most brilliant periods that the glittering trappings bestowed by mercenary love could quiet the throbbing heart that beat beneath them 
and now my only wish is to be forgiven and received by my family and to pass the short remainder of my days with them you can intercede with them successfully for they can refuse you nothing deign them madame to interest yourself for me and at the same time be assured that it is my purpose to withdraw myself for ever from mr vassiver whenever he will suffer me to go which shall he says be whenever you will give him hopes of listening to him if generosity sincerity good nature and understanding may be sufficient recommendations to your good opinion mr vassiver eminently deserves it and whatever faults he may have your virtues will correct he knows nothing of my writing to you but i am conscious that i owe him such an effort when the felicity of his future days is concerned and i feel that in addressing you my presumption if not successful will be forgiven i have the honour to be madame your most obedient servant emily cathcart celestina could not pursue such a letter without a mixture of admiration and pity for the amiable unhappy writer though her resolution in regard to vassiver could not be changed she thought that she should no longer delay acquainting mrs elphinstone and cathcart with the information she had obtained relative to their sister but it required some consideration at least in regard to cathcart the circumstance of emily's letter added to the flutter of spirits which the meeting in the morning had given her montague thoroughgood who dined with lady horatia and was to be one of the their party at ranelagh contrived to be more than usually importunate with her for more pity and favour than she had lately shrewn him while the ladies and mr howard who joined them in the evening completed her anguish and confusion by talking of the marriage which was in a few days to take place between miss fitzhaman and mr willoughby one of these was acquainted with mrs calder and had heard from her that morning that everything was settled the title arranged the equipages and liveries bespoke and the jewels and cloaks concluded upon all of which she detailed at great length while another said that she understood that the marriage was to take place at castle north and that from thence all the family were to proceed together to italy where they were to pass a twelvemonth all however agreed that it was certainly to be concluded immediately and celestina could not any longer entertain a doubt of it though her heart had always revolted from the idea of willoughby's union with miss fitzhaman she had been now so long accustomed to think of it that she felt less poignant concern on that account but if possible more than ever from his continued coldness and the cruel neglect he had been guilty of in not answering her letter that he marries another cried she as she reflected on it i might learn to submit to without murmuring if it can contribute to his ease or happiness in any way but that he should quite desert and forsake me after so many assurances of esteem and regard even when love was no longer in question that he should disdain to own that connection by blood if he is sure that it is so which made him with so much apparent reluctance relinquish every other that he should without pity leave me to a destiny which owes its unhappiness to him seems so strange so unnatural so unlike him if i could once see him hear him talk to me with friendly calmness and tell me that he felt for me fraternal affection 
or even the regard of long acquaintance even what his mother's ward might claim from him i think i should be comparatively happy and should have no farther wish than to hear sometimes from himself that he was happy too but to be thrown from him in this unfeeling and unfriendly way to be forgotten and abandoned as if i had been found unworthy not only of his affection but of his remembrance oh it is too much these reflections and the uninteresting conversation of the company she was with to which she was compelled to attend in order to escape the more irksome inopportunity of montague thurgood served but little to raise her spirits they did not reach ranlay till a late hour but on their entrance the first party they met was lady castlenorth her daughter and lady molyneux captain cavanagh was on one side between the two former and in deep conference with the latter was captain thurgood the ladies who could not avoid seeing celestina passed her with adverted and haughty looks cavanagh fixed his eyes on her with a look of bold inquiry and captain thurgood as he passed his brother said ho oh, montague are you there i did not know you were in town my boy he then gave a significant nod as much as to say a a i see how you are engaged and passed on renewing with great seeming earnestness his conversation with lady molyneux though there was not in the world another set of people whom celestina could be so little pleased to meet and though she heard throughout the room and from every group that passed them the report of willoughby's marriage with various comments and circumstances such as every body thought themselves at liberty to adorn it with she felt a sort of satisfaction in seeing that he was not with them and while there was not anything she really so ardently desired as his happiness yet so contradictory is the human heart that she wished to believe he married miss fitzhaman reluctantly though a marriage under such circumstances must above all other things render him miserable montague thorogood elated more than ever by hope and encouraged to persevere by lady horatia having now too in consequence of the purchase his father had made for him more pretensions to aspire to her than his unsettled fortune had before given him and sanguinely interpreting her gentle refusals her friendly admirations to desist as giving him all the encouragement she could do while her fate in regard to willoughby was not absolutely decided was on this evening particularly pressing and earnest while her languor and weariness the encouragement which she was conscious she seemed to have given him her pity and even her regard for him with the certainty of his ardent love for her gave her altogether the air of listening to him favourably and while her mind was frequently fixed on willoughby and she hardly recollected that montague thurgood was talking to her she seemed to be hearing the latter with complacency and approving of conversation which it was not necessary for her to answer at length the short time lady horatia meant to pass at ranelagh was over she was fatigued and celestina rejoiced to hear her say she should go home as montague thurgood and mr howard were with them the other gentlemen remained with the ladies who intended to stay longer and lady horatia taking the arm of her relation left celestina to the care of montague thurgood and they were in this order proceeding towards the entrance when standing near one of the niches 
his hat over his eyes and his head leaning against the wall they saw themselves close to willoughby who was in that attitude listening to some very earnest conversation from vassiver who stood by him the crowd about the entrance was considerable and celestina holding the arm of montague thurgood was so near them that they both at the same moment saw her willoughby started as if he had been crossed by a spectre and without waiting to look a second time he pushed through the crowd and disappeared but vassiver came up to celestina and said in his usual way taking abruptly the hand that was at liberty you must give me leave miss du Maurier, to see you to your carriage celestina dreading to give occasion to anything like altercation between him and thurgood answered coldly but civilly that she thanked him but thurgood who had not forgotten or forgiven the mortification she received from him at york and on other occasions could not now help resenting what seemed to be a repetition of such insulting behaviour he therefore walking very hastily on with celestina said no sir there is no occasion for you to give yourself that trouble, for Miss de Moray is under my care. I did not mean, sir, replied Vassiver fiercely, to ask your leave to wait on this lady, and I beg you will not take the liberty to address yourself to me. Pray, Mr. Vassiver, said Celestina, trembling, do not persecute and terrify me with this sort of behavior. She then saw by his countenance, and by the eager way in which he grasped the hand he held, that he was very far from being sober, and her terror increased. "'I did not mean to persecute or terrify you,' cried he. "'No, by heaven! But damn if I can with any temper see that fellow always at your ear, and affecting to be favoured. Come, come!' leave the pendant to his meditations, and don't forsake your old friends. The petticoats that he is to wear are his protection. And this lady's presence, sir, said Thurgood, is yours, or be assured I should answer you in a very different way. Celestina, now alarmed even to agony by the menacing look of Vassiver, who quitted her hand and stepped before Thorogood, screamed out to Mr. Howard and Lady Horatia, but the crowd had so far divided them from her that neither heard her, and before she could effectually interfere to prevent it, such words had passed between Vassiver and Thorogood as nothing but blood is, by the laws of honour, supposed to atone for celestina who heard them in a fright not to be described now disengaged herself from both of them and not knowing what she did only having some confused idea that she might meet captain thurgood in the room she ran back thither alone her beauty and her terror whether it was thought real or affected gave her in the opinion of the first group she met the appearance of some young creature desirous to attract attention. Three or four young men surrounded her, and inquired what service they could do her. Breathless and ready to faint, she answered that she was in search of Captain Thurgood. Egad! cried one of them. Captain Thurgood is a devilish lucky fellow. And a very tasteless one, said another to leave such a lovely creature to seek for him. Celestina now understood how entirely they mistook her, and collecting some presence of mind, said, For heaven's sake, gentlemen, assist me to find him. His brother is engaged in a quarrel, a quarrel I fear on my account. And she would have gone on, but unhappily for her the party of men who surrounded her were all of that description which are called 
bucks who fancy they distinguish themselves by shrewing how little they deserve the character of men one or two of these hearing of a quarrel found they had no disposition to engage where there might be trouble or danger and therefore walked away but three others had now time to consider the eminent beauty of celestina and to have settled in their own minds that she was a girl without character which her being alone and even what she had told them of a quarrel on her account seemed to authorize they were therefore all determined not to let her go and far from thinking of relieving the terror in which they saw her and which they indeed believed to be a mere piece of acting two of them took her arms within theirs and held her with such discourse as increased her alarm almost to distraction she now knew not what she said terror for herself had so mingled itself with her fears of what might happen between vassiver and thurgood that she sometimes angrily entreated her persecutors to release her then humbly besought them to see for captain thurgood till at length as they led her again towards the door her fears were become insupportable and shrieking she entreated them rather to kill her than expose her to such horror as she felt at this moment however by a sudden spring she disengaged herself willoughby was returning alone along the passage she saw him and threw herself into his arms save me save me willoughby was all she could utter before quite overcome with variety of terrors she became almost senseless her head resting on his shoulder and his arms supporting her he looked sternly on the young men and demanded the occasion of the lady's alarm they replied that they knew nothing more than that she had run into the room alone inquiring for a captain somebody and that they had endeavoured to find the cause of her fright and to assist her willoughby who did not believe this but who was more solicitous to recover the fainting celestina than to punish these idle boys waved with his hand for them to be gone and they immediately obeyed for it was the defenceless only they had courage to insult willoughby then by the assistance of a gentleman whom he happened to know led celestina who was just sensible into the room where the ladies cloaks are received and while his friend ran to get her a glass of water willoughby placed himself by her and with one hand round her waist supported her with the other nor could he forbear as he gazed on her pale but still lovely countenance pressing her to that heart which had been so long fondly devoted to her in a very short time she drew a deep sigh and recovering recollection begged his pardon in a voice hardly articulate for the trouble she had given him she remembered that to the husband the lover of miss fitzhaman it must be trouble and she withdrew herself from his arms before he could ask her so absorbed was he in the mingled sensations of pain and pleasure what had occasioned the alarm in which he had seen her for a sigh still deeper than hers he now made this inquiry she answered but not very distinctly that high words had arisen between mr vassiver and mr montague thorogood and that not able to check their impetuously nor to overtake lady horatia and mr howard who were gone on before she had foolishly run back into the room to find somebody who might part them when those young men had surrounded and insulted her till in her fear she knew not what she did and all this terror all this excessive apprehension was for mr montague thorogood said willoughby 
in a faltering but not a tender voice then as if he had discovered nothing but what he had before known enough of to be easy under he seemed at once to repress all appearance of interest as far as it related to celestina and said with forced coldness i dare say madame you have nothing to apprehend for his precious life however i will seek my friend vassiver and take care at least for to-night that it goes no farther if you will tell me where i can find him and whither i shall have the honour of conducting you celestina was heartstruck by the manner in which this was uttered she turned her expressive eyes on his to inquire whether he could really behave thus cruelly towards her his eyes met hers but as if he could not bear her looks he turned them away towards the door where his friend now entered with the water and almost at the same moment mr howard came in and told her that lady horatia had been in great alarm at her not following her to the coach where she now waited for her she did not give him time to finish the sentence before she eagerly asked if he had seen mr montague thoroughgood seen him cried mr howard no certainly is he not with you C celestina would then have related what had happened but her returning apprehensions that something fatal might have already been the consequence and the look with which willoughby surveyed her entirely deprived her of the power of speech and willoughby himself in a few words related to mr howard what she had told him i do not know added he what ground miss de moray has had for the alarm she has been in but i know vassiver was not sober and possibly may have been wrong-headed it will therefore be necessary perhaps for me to inquire after him and as you madame seem to be now recovered and are safe in the protection of mr howard i will wish you good night having hurried over these words he bowed to mr howard then with equal coolness to celestina and disappeared a shower of tears the first she had been able to shed fell from the eyes of celestina as she lost sight of him these tears however and the water she had drank a little relieved her and mr howard again representing the uneasiness in which he had left lady horatia she collected strength enough to avail herself of the assistance he offered her and leaning on his arm reached the coach where she was compelled however unequal to the recital to relate to lady horatia what had happened within the twenty minutes for more had not elapsed that she had lost sight of her lady horatia expressed great apprehensions for montague thoroughgood and though with great appearance of truth that unless he had gone immediately away with vassiver to decide their difference that evening he would have sought them again and have relieved them from the extreme apprehensions which he must imagine they must be under on his account these conjectures which were but too well founded and which they had no means of satisfying kept lady horatia and celestina awake the whole night towards morning the former who was less deeply interested and more accustomed to the painful events of life than celestina found some repose but celestina herself was up by break of day listening to every noise in the street and trembling every moment lest she could hear of some fatal accident and her reflections which no longer offered her anything to hope were busy in representing and magnifying all the evils which she had to apprehend
End of Volume 4, Chapter 4 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 4, Chapter 5 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 4, Chapter 5. The cruel suspense as to the extraordinary disappearance of Montague Thorgood with Vassiver the evening before lasted till near ten o'clock, when, as Lady Horatia and Celestina were sitting at a breakfast table, where the uneasiness they were both under did not allow them to eat, a servant announced Captain Thorgood. Celestina turned as pale as death at the name but there was no time to express any part of the fear she felt before he entered. His air was assuming, confident, and what the French call glorieux, but from that Celestina could judge nothing, for she knew he had too little regard for his brother to have been much affected at anything that might have befallen him. He paid his compliments in the common form to Lady Horatia, who was too much concerned to be able to answer them, and then turning to the silent, trembling Celestina, he said, with an unfeeling smile, Well, madame, your young champion is living. Good God! cried Celestina. Has he ever, then, been in danger? Yes, replied the captain. He has been in all the danger that a man can be who has a brace of pistols fired at him and is now in as much as is usual to a man who has a ball lodged in his shoulder celestina could not speak she could with difficulty breathe but lady horatia now eagerly inquired the particulars and learned that in consequence of violent language that passed between Vassiver and Montague Thorogood, after Celestina left them the preceding evening, a challenge had passed, and a meeting been appointed in Chelsea Fields at seven o'clock in the morning, that Thorogood, after quitting Vassiver, had in vain endeavoured to find out Lady Horatia and Celestina, and meeting his brother, and relaying to him what had happened, was by him dissuaded from attempting it, as he could not see them without informing them of what had passed, and was yet to happen, that he had therefore gone home with Captain Thorogood, who had, at the appointed time, attended him to the field, where Vassiver was with a friend, and where, the preliminaries being soon settled, each fired without effect, but neither declaring themselves satisfied. They fired again, and Montague Thorogood received a ball in his shoulder, which was not extracted when his brother left him at his lodgings, whither he was immediately, whither he was immediately conveyed, and where he was attended by an eminent surgeon. And is he in danger, sir? said Celestina, with all that tremendous tenderness in her voice that her extreme sensibility gave her. Is he in danger? Is he in pain? Captain Thorogood gave her a look which seemed to say humph. It is true, then, that you are violently in love with this brother of mine, and then answered, the surgeon on whose skill I have great reason to rely does not seem to think him in danger, but till the ball is extracted, which will be attended with pain enough, it is not, I fancy, easy to speak very positively. However, Miss Delmoray, Montague won't complain of the pain, 
let it be as severe as it will while he recollects that he suffers in your defence and hears what i shall not fail to relate how dearly you are interested for him celestina could not say that this unlucky affair did not originate about her indeed she had not at the moment strength to enter on any explanation nor could she deny that she was extremely concerned or make captain thoroughgood comprehend that for a stranger under the same circumstances she should have been greatly if not equally sorry as to lady hiroshia who hoped that this accident would operate decisively on behalf of montague she rather encouraged than contradicted the idea that his brother seemed to entertain of celestina's partiality towards him and now the captain with as much unconcern as if nothing had happened seemed only desirous of displaying his own consequence and his own perfections as if to convince them both that for a woman who had ever seen him and his brother together to prefer the latter was an instance of most terrible want of discernment several times was celestina who could hardly support herself on the point of withdrawing but she thought that were she to quit the room it would look still more as if she was sinking under her apprehensions and she besides feared that were she absent the zeal of lady hiroshia would induce her to explain to captain thoroughgood more of her wishes and projects in regard to her and his brother than feeling as she did the impossibility of their ever taking place ought in discretion or in justice to be talked of for these reasons wretched and distressed as she was she had yet resolution enough to remain in her place still at the length captain thoroughgood having paraded about himself for near half an hour withdrew it was then that from the conversation of her friend celestina understood how much such an event would be expected to affect her sentiments in favor of montague thurgood and how impossible lady hiroshia considered it for her after all the sufferings he must sustain on her account to delay rewarding those sufferings and his long and ardent attachment to her longer than till his recovery of which notwithstanding what captain thoroughgood had said of the possibility of danger she seemed not to doubt though she expressed great concern for the pain he must endure and great anxiety to be informed of his actual situation to all that she said celestina hardly answered a word her heart was too much oppressed and she could say nothing that would not appear either like insensibility ingratitude or like the anxious solicitude of love she wished to avoid either she wished to be alone and though the determination of lady hiroshia almost immediately formed to visit montague thoroughgood herself was a measure which must strongly confirm all the reports that she wished to discourage yet it released to her her own reflections and she was glad at that moment to see her friend depart her own reflections to which she was now left were most uneasy she knew that such an affair most unavoidably be much and immediately talked of she knew how much it would be misrepresented and what conclusions would be made upon it the expression used by willoughby the evening before still vibrated in her ears what and is all this terror all this apprehension for montague thoroughgood it was displeasing then to him that she should feel an interest for montague thoroughgood and the 
little tenderness he had appeared to shrew her was repressed the moment he understood who was the subject of her alarm conscious that hopeless as she had long been of his affection and submitting to the necessity of their separation she had yet never bestowed on another the heart he had resigned she could not bear to think how much every circumstance had contributed to make him think that she had highly given it to the first candidate nor could her mind dwell without extreme concern on that pain would give the elder mr thoroughgood whose hopes were she well knew centred in his youngest son and who would not only be distressed by the sickness and danger to which he had thus exposed himself but he hurt at his having acted so contrary to the principles he had always endeavoured to inculate as to giving or receiving a challenge not were the sufferings of montague thoroughgood himself the least part of her concern she apprehended he might be long confined in great pain he might perhaps lose his arm or even his life and while she regretted his rashness which had been the occasion of this hazard she could not but acknowledge that it was impossible a young man of spirit could otherwise have answered the unprovoked ferocity of vassover of him she thought with terror and knowing that he was capable of, of any impiety in the humour he was now in she gave immediate orders that if he came she should be denied all the circumstances of the preceding evening which the fear that had been best her during the latter part of it had for a while driven from her recollection now returned to it and the repeated intelligence she had received throughout the day of willoughby's marriage all the particulars with which it had been related the happy looks of miss fitzhaman the proud triumph that sat on the features of her mother and the forced friendship with which lady molyneux seemed to have connected herself with persons who were so lately the objects of her aversion all confirmed the reports that were in circulation so as to put their truth beyond a doubt in a few days she was to hear of their actually being married to listen again to the detail of their nuptial splendour perhaps to witness them she was to be surrounded by a thousand impertinent people who would inquire and talk to her about the duel and with a heart so oppressed must attend to them with patience and answer them with civility the whole prospect before her was too unpleasant she fancied it impossible to be endured and resolved to attempt though at the hazard of appearing ungrateful perhaps of disobliging her best and almost her only friend to solicit leave to go down to jessie at least till the public conversation should have been turned to some other topic and the public curiosity no longer excited by the marriage of miss fitzhaman or the reconnoitre of vassiver and thoroughgood the natural softness of her heart made her song the natural softness of her heart made her among all these sources of particular uneasiness really and tenderly interested for montague thoroughgood and she awaited the return of lady horatia with as much solicitude as she could have felt if a beloved brother had been in such a situation perhaps she would have felt more for nobody but willoughby himself it was therefore a great relief to her harassed spirits when she heard that while captain thoroughgood had been in park street the bullet had been extracted that no bone had been injured by it 
and that he was as good a way as could be expected. The surgeon declaring that, from the nature of the wound and the good constitution of the patient, he thought him in no danger, and should probably, at the end of a fortnight, dismiss him with his arm in a sling. The satisfaction Celestina expressed on his account was not, however, increased, when Lady Horatia added that far from complaining of his sufferings, he exulted and rejoiced them, flattering himself that she for whom he could willingly have risked a hundred lives if he had possessed them would feel some pity for him and knowing how much power in such a heart as hers the sentiment had to produce others still more favourable lady horatia then went on to say very seriously to celestina that she ought no longer to trifle with such a man, but resolve immediately to give him her hand, not only as the reward of his merit, but to preclude the dangerous pretensions of Vassiver, to whose perseverance, said she, no refusal, no repulse seems to put an end. Dearest madame, said Celestina, did I ever trifle with Mr. Thoroughgood? Surely I never meant it, so far from it. I have an hundred times regretted that your ladyship's partiality towards him, and the influence you have and ought to have over me, have combined to keep him in an error, which all my candid dealing with him has not had the power to refute. I have told him, whenever he has urged the subject, that he is in possession of my esteem and of my friendship, but that for my love I have it not to bestow. But he is content, my dear, with your esteem, with your friendship, and knows that, in such a heart as yours, love will follow his attachment to you, especially as you now surely cannot allege that any other person possesses it. Celestina, too conscious of all these circumstances that ought long since to have induced her to withdraw it from Willoughby, yet equally conscious that she could never feel for another that degree of affection of which she had been sensible for him, was silent a moment or two, and then said, Dear Lady Horatia, why must I marry at all? While you afford me your protection, I can be happier, and should I be unhappy enough to lose it, should I not be more likely to meet content even with my small and humble fortune? If I remained single, then I gave my hand where I have no power to bestow my heart. I am amazed, replied Lady Horatia that with such very good sense as you possess, you would accustom yourself to cherish these childish and girlish notions. What is this love, without feeling all the violence of which you suppose it impossible to be happy? Dear madame, cried Celestina, interrupting her, I have not heard you say that you once was sensible of yourself, and that having been compelled to quit the man of your choice, you considered such a necessity as a heavy affection, and that it rendered most of the occurrences of your subsequent life indifferent to you. Yes, you have heard me say so. I merely acknowledged a folly, a weakness, which I pretended not to defend in myself and certainly not to encourage in you. What has been the life of this man, whom I called, in the romantic simplicity of sixteen, my first love? When my father parted us, and I was compelled by his authority to give my hand to General Howard, he was a younger brother, 
with very little fortune. In a twelve month afterwards, the death of his elder brother and an uncle gave him a very large fortune, and he quitted the navy, where he had, for so young a man, highly distinguished himself, and with his profession he seemed to resign his virtues. He married a woman towards whom he professed himself indifferent, and whose only recommendation was a fortune nearly as large as his own. To her he behaved with neglect, which she repaid with scorn and infidelity. They seemed to agree in nothing but mutual extravagance, till at length they parted, and he now lives in France the greatest part of the year, at other times wanders about the world, to gratify his taste for variety, and fly from those corrosive reflections which must pursue him who has ruined his health and his fortune by debauchery. Can I, when I consider all this, help despising myself for the pain I felt at being separated from such a man, and ought I not rather to rejoice at what once appeared as insupportable misfortune? Ah, madame, said Celestina, it is well if by these reflections you have been enabled to conquer those remains of useless regret which might otherwise have embittered your life. But you give me leave to ask, since there is now no danger of renewing them, give me leave to ask whether you sincerely believe that this gentleman, had he married you, would have passed a life as blamable. You have told me that he was passionately attached to you. You now say to the lady he married he was indifferent. Surely to that may be imputed all his heirs. The mind became unhinged when he lost her to whom it was devoted, and he aggravated himself the cruelty of his destiny. To you he might have been an excellent husband, because he loved you, but losing the possibility of being happy, he lost the wish to be respectable, and since he could not live with you, cared not with whom or how he lived. There may be some truth, said Lady Horotia, in your remarks, but to be tolerably easy, Celestina, in this world, you must learn to be more of an optimist, and to believe that whatever happens could not, nor ought to, have been otherwise. Thus the inference of Lady Castlenorth, whatever might have been her motives, has saved you from a marriage that might have been a hideous crime. Thus, not to enumerate other instances that must occur to your recollection, thus the wild brutality of Vassiver, and even the wound of Montague, will all contribute finally to good, and produce that happiness for you with him, which I do not believe you would have found with any other person. To this doctrine Celestina could not agree, but the fear and fatigue she had within the last twenty-four hours undergone disqualified her for any farther discussion on the subject at present, or for the attempt she meant to make to prevail on Lady Horotia to allow her to go down to Jessie for a few weeks. Her eyes were indeed so heavy, her complexion so pale in consequence of her long agitation that now the immediate fears for Montague Thurgood's life were over. Lady Horotia advised her to take some repose, a proposal which she gladly accepted, and in despite of the variety of uneasiness she still laboured under, exhausted nature obtained for her a few hours' respite in sleep, though she was, in her previous contemplations, 
so far from assenting heartily to the resigned philosophy of lady horotia that she thought with anguish of the fate of willoughby who might she feared by the same disappointments in the early part of his life become quite unlike what he was once and from his cruel neglect of her since he had been in london she already fancied she saw that this change had begun but could she for one moment have seen the real estate of that mind whose virtues she believed to be tarnished she would have found it as worthy as ever of her tenderness and engulfed to all her pity tormented by an affection which he could not indulge for one woman and entangled by a series of perverse events in an engagement with another embarrassed in his circumstances and discontented with himself his whole life passed in a continual tumult of contending passions and whatever means he took to calm and mitigate them seemed only to irritate his sufferings thus when he left his own lodgings on the day of his interview with miss fitzhaman and his meeting celestina he went to the hotel where vassiver usually lived when he was in town and where it happened that a party of their mutual acquaintance that day dined this prevented his having any conversation with vassiver which though it might have contributed but little to relieve his vexation as to montague thoroughgood would have eased his heart by unburdening it to his friend and vassiver drank so much that there was afterwards no hopes of his hearing him rationally with him he was prevailed upon at a late hour to go to ranlaw where he saw celestina again with the very man to whom he had been so repeatedly told she had engaged herself and there though celestina happened not to see them together he was compelled to take several turns with lady castlenorth her daughter and his sister thus confirming by his appearance in public with the two former what it was indeed too late to retract though he had already most bitterly repented it the quarrel between vassiver and montague thoroughgood of which he is suddenly quitting the place where he met celestina was partly the occasion for he had stayed he might have prevented it added to the conviction he now had that thoroughgood was very soon to be her husband and increased his vexation in despite of all that reason could say to counteract the effect of it that reason repeatedly asked him if celestina had really been brought up and acknowledged as his sister and had with no small a fortune been addressed by thoroughgood and herself approved him whether he could in such a case have made any reasonable objection he was compelled to answer no yet his heart revolted against the assent which common sense urged him to give to a marriage which differed in nothing from what would then have been the case but in early prejudice he never could learn to consider celestina as related to him by blood nor did all the pains he had taken to learn the truth convince him of it though he dared not act as if he wholly disbelieved it yet so perverse is an heart under the influence of such passion as he felt that while he had relinquished her and agreed to marry another left that relationship should really exist he detested thoroughgood for having as he believed possessed himself of those affections which otherwise than as her brother he had owed he dared not claim 
when he left celestina under the care of mr howard at ranla the preceding evening he had gone as he promised in search of vassiver but not finding him any where about the room or in the avenues to the rotunda he had gone to his lodgings and waited there till near four in the morning he then left orders with his servant to send for him the moment his master came but vassiver instead of returning to his lodging at all that evening slept somewhere else and only called there in a hackney coach at half past five o'clock to take his pistols and his servant being ordered to attend him with the surgeon there was no possibility of his man giving willoughby notice and of course he could do nothing to stop reconnoitre of what he did not hear till after it was over vassiver who then came to him was not sober and willoughby saw with more concern than surprise that the habits his friend had acquired since his last absence were becoming invertate and were ruining alike his constitution his fortune as and his understanding though he himself detested montague thoroughgood and cursed the hour when he had put celestina under the protection of his father and by that means thrown him into her way he was too generous even to an enemy not to feel that vassiver had behaved with unwarrantable brutality and notwithstanding his long friendship for him he felt too that had he been as successful as he believed thoroughgood to be all the friendship would have been cancelled he was vexed however at the conversation which this foolish business must occasion and in which he knew the name of celestina must be joined with that of montague thoroughgood and when vassiver spoke with some triumph of his having chastised the young pendant willoughby with a peevishness very unusual with him said he heartily wished he had let it alone from the little conversation he had with lady castlenorth the evening before he found she expected him to wait on them the next day reluctantly and with an aching heart he had then given a sort of promise and with still more regret he recollected it the sun now never rose for him but to bring him a renewal of misery and his dejection never left him but to give place to paroxysms of passion and fits of fruitless despair as the hour approached when he knew he was expected at the home of his uncle his unwillingness to go increased farnham who now anxiously watched all his looks saw a deeper gloom come upon him he saw him take out several letters read them replace them then snatch up a pen write a few lines and hurry across the room as if undecided what to do at length he wrote a few lines sealed the note and put it in his pocket farnham had heard a great deal of the duel that had happened the evening before and knew it was about miss dormoray and that a gentleman had been wounded dangerously he had heard conversation between his master and vassiver and supposed from their manner that they parted in anger this circumstance put in his head which was rather an honest than a clear one that some other affair of honour in which his master was concerned was still in agitation and he so thoroughly persuaded himself of this that he determined to observe narrowly everything that happened and to take all possible precautions against his master's having such an accident befell him 
as had happened to Mr. Montague Thorogood. For this purpose he attached himself very closely to the hole in the door between the dining-room and the bedchamber, and when he was summoned by a furious ring to attend him, he was under the necessity of first slipping softly downstairs, and then running up to ask his commands. Willoughby gave him two notes, and asked if the groom was within. On hearing he was not, then go yourself, said he, with these two notes. No answer is required to either. Return as soon as you can. Farnham, promising to be expeditious, left him, and reading the directions, found one to be to Miss de Moray, the other to Mr. Vassiver. This, with all he knew of his master's former attachment, and embarrassing doubts about Celestina, and all that had happened that evening before, and that morning, convinced him beyond a doubt that another duel would happen, which he imagined it to be his particular duty to prevent. He was not very fertile in expedients, but it occurred to him that the best way would be to carry both these letters and at the same time communicate his fears to Sir Philip and Lady Molino. Sir Philip was not home, but Lady Molino, on hearing he wanted to speak to her, ordered him up. He opened his business with great gravity, detailed all the cause he had for apprehension, from his master's behavior, and produced the two notes. Lady Molino affected to agree with him as to the justice of his fears, and to commend his prudence and fidelity. Then she told him she thought it would be the best way to open the letters, which, as she happened to have a seal with the Willoughby arms, the same as her brother's, she could easily reseal and send if they contained nothing of which they suspected, and if they did, that it would be proper to destroy them. Poor Farnham, trembling as he spoke, assented to all this, only treating her to take care that his master might never know. This she readily promised, and taking all the blame upon herself, bade him retire while she opened the letters and come up again when she rang. She then read them, that to Vassiver was merely to put off an appointment for the evening, which Willoughby found himself unable to attend, that to Celestina ran thus. I should have sent to you, madame, immediately on my arrival in London, but illness for some days prevented my being able even to write and in that interval I heard that you were on the point of putting yourself into the protection of one who might deem such an address improper and render it needless, that you have come to this resolution without consulting any of those who were once honoured with your friendship, I can now no longer doubt. I, however, feel it in some measure incumbent upon me to offer you every service in my power, to say that as soon as my own affairs are settled, I shall have the honour of troubling you on pecuniary matters, and if, in the meantime, you have had any wish to see me as your friend, I will obey your summons, but leave it wholly to yourself. I shall consider your silence as an acknowledgment that such a interview will be painful to you, and submit to offer, at a distance, those sincere wishes for your happiness, which must ever be felt by. Dear Madame, your obedient and most humble servant, George Willoughby, Bond Street, May seventeenth, seventeen eighty nine. This letter, cold and unlike his former style to Celestina as it was, his sister immediately resolved to suppress, 
her hatred to celestina was increased to a degree of inverted malignity of which it was difficult to conceive her haughty indolence was capable and this arose cheesily from the admiration she everywhere saw her beauty excited which was a point in which she could not bear to be excelled convinced as she internally was that celestina was an orphan stranger brought up on her mother's charity she chose rather to leave the report of their relationship uncontradicted than to see her united to her brother and put on a footing with herself to which that equivocal relationship could give her no claim and since the suppression of her letter to willoughby which an interview now would explain she was doubly solicitous to prevent it her pride would not bear that her brother should be come the humble and reduced country gentleman that he must submit to be if he married a woman without fortune and her avarice represented the possibility of his being in such a case a burden on his affluent relations all these considerations determined to her to stifle it and the sentence with which the letter concluded assured her she might do it with impunity she therefore called up farnham on whose inquiry it was very easy to impose and told him that the letter to mr vassiver was very immaterial and that he might carry that but the other to miss moray was of a nature to involve his master in great difficulties and that therefore she would destroy it she then put it in the fire and bid him carry the other which she had carefully resealed this farnham immediately did but being unwilling to be guilty of a greater falsehood than there seemed to be occasion for he actually went to park street that he might tell his master he had been there on his return willoughby questioned him who he saw at lady horatia's for this question the poor fellow was not prepared however he answered i saw john sir my lady's own footman well and was miss de moray at home no sir replied farnham who had now acquired courage but you know you bade me not to wait for an answer well but had you not the sense to ask where she was no sir to be sure i did not think of that but however i fancy she was visiting sir the wounded gentleman in oxford street willoughby knew that montague thoroughgood lodged there and that it must be him alone who was described as the wounded gentleman and why do you think so sir said he fiercely as if poor farnham had been accessory to it and what the devil have you to do to think about it lord sir cried farnham only because as i came along i saw my lady's coach at the door where i knew young mr thoroughgood lodges and just nodded to sam who was upon the box cursed fool exclaimed willoughby could you not have asked whether she was there or no yet why i should desire to know added he rising and walking about with his hands clenched together what is it to me and why do i torment myself go sir and fetch my powdering gown and my things to dress poor farnham convinced that lady molyneux was right in what she had done yet rendered doubtly timid by the conscientiousness of having committed a sort of fraud on his master hastily obeyed end of volume four chapter five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume four chapter six
of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume Four, Chapter Six. The situation of Celestina was rendered infinitely more uneasy to her by the transactions of the last two or three days, and her spirits could no longer support her. The certainty of meeting Willoughby wherever she went and of meeting him only to be more and more convinced that he had ceased to feel any degree of affection for her made the thoughts of continuing her present mode of life which had any charms in her opinion quite unsupportable to her the conversation about the duel the questions she should be asked and the impertinence she must attend to increased the aversion with which she thought of appearing again in public and she determined at any hazard to propose to lady horotia that she might go into the country and there wait wherever she pleased till she should herself quit london she took therefore the first moment they were alone together to prefer and urge this request and after making some objections which however the altered looks and depressed spirits of celestina very forcibly combated lady horotia consented to her going but as the house of jessie was too near elvestone which it was supposed willoughby and his bride were immediately to go after their marriage it was settled that she would with a maid to attend her go to cheltenham and wait there till lady horotia could leave london which she proposed doing in a fortnight or three weeks at farthest this plan being once arranged celestina was impatient till it was executed and so effectually set about the little preparations she had to make that the next day she left london and for the first time since her quitting the hybrids enjoyed the calm solitude she loved wretched in the meantime was the state of willoughby he went to dine at lord castlenorth's as he had been obliged to promise where a large company were assembled as if to receive him for the first time as the heir and acknowledged son-in-law of lord castlenorth he had however no power to conceal under the common forms of life the misery of his internal feelings his countenance refused to wear the forced smile of complacence his emotion when the duel was talked of and the name of celestina was introduced was evident enough to all but those who did not choose to see it lord castlenorth was indeed never much celebrated for discernment but his lady, who highly piqued herself on her sagacity, on the facility with which she read characters and penetrated the views of those with whom she conversed, her blindness therefore was evidently wilful, and that of her daughter, unless her love or her vanity intercepted her right, was equally strange. Certain it was that they either could not or would not attend to the reluctant melancholy of willoughby under which he with difficulty concealed the bitter agonies of despair and they appeared perfectly satisfied with him and with themselves there was one face however in the circle that though it wore looks of festivity yet was now and then seen to survey willoughby with indignant scorn and then as if checked for indulging it to resume the smile of approbation and complacency captain kavanagh indeed did not very frequently address himself to him but conversed chiefly with the ladies but wherever he did speak to him 
Willoughby himself, who had till now very little noticed him, could not help remarking that there was something peculiar in his manner. When the gentlemen were left together, Lord Castlenorth, who could not drink, and whose health obliged him to retire early, called to his nephew and bade him to take his place. This Willoughby, who had been all day meditating how he might make an early escape, was compelled to do, though he observed, that as Captain Kavanagh usually took that seat when his lordship retired, he wished him then to assume it. Lord Castlenorth, however, persisted, and Willoughby, willing to get rid of an irksome task as soon as possible, made the wine circulate so quickly that, as he was never in habits of drinking, he soon began to find himself losing his dejection in a kind of bewildering stupor. Anything seemed better to him than the task of entertaining Miss Fitzhaman for the rest of the evening, and he felt he by degrees ceased to think of her. He found some satisfaction in drinking, and was very soon completely intoxicated. He was no longer capable of judging for himself, or he would not have gone upstairs in such a situation. He had just recollection enough left to stay without committing any great extravagance, while tea was served, and then gladly followed a servant who whispered to him that Lord Castlenorth desired the favour of seeing him in his own apartment. Thither he staggered with very little consciousness, and being seated where his uncle sat opposite to him, in a great chair, while several parchments lay open on a table, he heard, but without the least comprehension of what was said, a long harangue, on fortune and family, heraldry and genealogy, titles and successions, the whole of which concluded by his informing him that the money was ready to pay off all the encumbrances on his estate, which was to be immediately done, that the settlements were in hand, and to be finished in a week, and that that day fortnight was fixed for the marriage. Willoughby, between the verbose confusion of his uncle's mode of delivery and his own incapacity of attention, heard it all but understood nothing. He was not, however, so unconscious of pain and sickness. Mrs. Calder, who, for the greater part of this conversation, had sat reading a treatise on bilious concretions, on the opposite side of the room, with her spectacles on, now finding Lord Castlenorth had done, and that Willoughby looked very lightly to sink out of his chair, very wisely ended this conversation, by sending up Farnham to his master, who had him conveyed home in a chair. The next morning he was awakened to a perfect recollection of all that had passed the evening before, and became too certain that the means he had taken to obtain a temporary release from his fetters had served only to rivet them more closely. Alas! he remembered too with poignant anguish remembered that so many hours had elapsed since he had written to Celestina, and that it was now too certain she would not answer his letter, and wholly decline seeing him. Though he had so often determined never to meet her again, so often persuaded himself not wish it, this cruel conviction of her total estrangement from him seemed to fall as heavily as if he had never dreamed of their separation. She might, however, be out of town. She might be engaged. Something might have prevented her writing. To this slender hope he clung for some hours of the morning, but it insensibly became fainter as his impatience increased and at length he ordered Farnham to find the coachman of Lady Horotia, with whom he was acquainted, and try to discover any particulars he could. Farnham, dreading lest his master should discover the imposition he had ventured to practice, 
dared not disobey him. He sat out there for, for the stables where, at that time in the morning, he was sure of finding his acquaintance. He found him indeed very busy in cleaning, with the aid of a postillion and a helper, two of his horses, which had been poor things, he said, the first stage to Cheltenham with Miss Dore and Rebecca the maid that my lady sent with her. Farnham made him repeat this intelligence, to which he added, Why, my lady and all of us be going down to Gloucester in about a fortnight, that is, as soon as young Mr. Thoroughgood is well enough to be moved, which the doctor as tends him says will be in that time or less my lady takes his illness sadly to heart and so does miss and went out of town sadly down in the mouth but howsoever tis well twas not worse you know and as he is like to do well there's no great harm and miss will be married all one the minutest article of this account was remembered by Farnham, and punctually related by him to his master, who now thoroughly convinced that all hope was at end of Celestina's retaining for him any affection, and a certainty so dreadful, the assurance of his being irrevocably engaged, and having gone into Gloucestershire there to wait the recovery of Montague Thurgood, the assurance that he should never see her more, all contributed, with his excess of the evening before, to inflame his blood, and by four o'clock he was in a high fever. His indisposition was increased by a visit from Vassiver, who laughed at the vexation and disgust he expressed at what had happened in regard to Montague Thoroughgood but grew graver when he had heard that, far from its having put an end to his pretensions to Celestina, it had served only to hasten their marriage. The wild and ill-founded projects of Vassiver to prevent this, and to succeed himself, which to Willoughby would have been equally hateful, were but little calculated to appease his agitation and quiet his boiling blood before vassiver went away he became delirious and farnham in a terrible fright went for lady molyneux and a physician lady molyneux was just stepping into her coach when the affrighted face of farnham appeared before her she chid him for the needless alarm he had given her and said that she supposed it was nothing but a little return of the fever her brother was subject to. I cannot, said she, call now, but as I come home this evening, I will see him. The physician, for whom Farnham then went, directly attended, and found his patient, though not in so high a fever as had seen him before, ill enough to require his immediate assistance, which he ordered with so happy an effect, that in a few hours the delirium entirely subsided, and Willoughby, though extremely languid, was at night almost free from his fever. Lady Molyneux, who called on him soon after midnight for a few moments, again blamed Farnham for his officious apprehensions and being well convinced that Willoughby would be glad of any excuse to keep him back the preparations which were now going on, she endeavoured to persuade him that his illness was very trizzling, and taking occasion to talk over what happened at Ranla, told her brother, laughingly, that she hoped he was now convinced of the attachment being young Thoroughgood and Miss de Moray adding, his brother, Captain Thoroughgood, who is really an elegant and fashionable man, tells me they are to be married the moment Montague is able to leave London. 
well well cried willoughby peevishly i know it and i do not desire to hear any more about it i thank you for calling on me but it is very late and my physician desires i will keep myself quiet lady molyneux then withdrew and poor willoughby to whom she had ministered a poison instead of a cordial tried to find that repose which he so greatly wanted but to him his estranged his lost celestina on one hand and on the other his intended bride seemed to cry sleep no more farnham who sat up by him to administer the medicine he was to take heard him sigh the greatest part of the night without ceasing and whenever he thought he might venture asked him how he did pry thee farnham said he after two or three of these questions do not ask me how i do how should a man do who is in the situation to envy everybody but the fellow just going to be hanged you know that i am at this moment the most miserable fellow upon earth i am sure i am very sorry to hear it answered his servant but if i might be so bold to speak i should say that i cannot think what cause you can have to be miserable nor he was going on when willoughby eagerly catching aside the curtain said what cause have i not lost an angel and i am not have i not condemned myself to marry a woman i cannot love no never never by heaven to be sure sir said farnham to be crossed in love as i may say is very bad as i have heard tell but in this here matter all things considered i hope your honour's mind will be settled about it and as for the two ladies to be sure beauty is all fancy miss celestina for certain is a fine young lady and so good and gentle to servants that it was always a pleasure to me to hear her speak to me and to wait upon her but then for certain miss fitzhaman though she is higher and more stately as she ought to be being as she is a lady of title and quality is a fine young lady too and a very majestic grand person and then her great riches curse on her riches exclaimed willoughby a sir said farnham who was not a little slattered by his confidence and was now got into one of his prosing humours a sir it is very well for young gentlemen to cry curse on this and that and to other but as for riches what can they do without them nobody is not respected the least in the world if they don't make a shoe and a figure and the like of that and can it be done without money no nor not without a pretty deal aunt and for my part i own i don't love to see my master not able to vie with the best lord of the land as to be sure he ought thou art a fool farnham cried willoughby do have done with thy lords of the land and give me twenty drops more of the opiate yes sir said farnham and prepared to obey him but while he was counting out the drops he could not forbear going on one two there are other people sir three four about the lord's house who it's my notion five six seven are not so apt to cry curse money eight nine ten there is captain kavanagh eleven twelve thirteen fourteen captain kavanagh interrupts willoughby what of captain kavanagh nay sir only the captain as far as i can find don't hate money nor cry curse it and damn it 
he has been long enough living about the world to know that nothing can be without it and that is all sir but that seems to me not to be all sir pray tell me what captain kavanagh has to do with what we are talking of with miss fitz Hayman. lord nothing sir i am sure that i know of only if the young lady was not engaged and in love with you perhaps the captain sir is reckoned by the woman a very handsome man sir and miss fitz Hayman may think so as well as another why he is married you booby what stuff have you got into your head and who has been talking to you of him and miss fitz Hayman? let him be reckoned as handsome as he will by the women he can be nothing to miss fitz Hayman, for i know he has been married some years eh sir i dare say that may be but there is such a thing as being unmarried again not that i ever heard i am sure much about the captain only justina was laughing one day and laying in her broken english so that i can't say i quite un right understood her that if my lord should die and the captain should ever be able to get rid of his wife she should not be much surprised if he and my lady was to make a match of it for that never was such a favorite as the captain i should not be much surprised at that myself answered willoughby for i believe the captain has a good deal of interest there so then he has been trying to get rid of his wife justina told me sir one day as a great secret that my lord had helped him to money to try at it but sir if justina should know i ever mentioned it i should never be able to get word out of her again i promise thee she never shall so tell me farnham all thou hast heard from her about lady castlenorth and the captain why sir it was not much but only justina was laughing the other day about my lady's having such a great friendship for him and there's no stopping her tongue when she begins so she told me lord sir a great many things that were odd enough to be sure but only ladies of quality i reckon don't much care what people says of them she said that my lady knew well enough that my lord could not hold it long and that she was providing herself with a handsome young husband and making sure of him as she thought before the old one hobbled off but let her take care said justina that she marries her daughter first or i know what will happen the captain knows well enough that a young woman is better than an old one and besides that such a great fortune as my young lady will have is better twenty to one than her mother's jointure this speech at once opened willoughby's eyes as to lady castlenorth's motives for the extreme haste and earnestness she had shown to conclude her daughter's marriage feeling as he did in regard to miss Hayman, he was sensible neither of jealousy or mortification at the idea of any preference she might entertain for kavanagh but a hope that from this circumstance something might happen to break off the connection for ever between him and his cousin involuntarily arose in his mind in any event it ought to be attended to he bade farnham therefore go the next day and see if he could set justina gossiping again i have a notion farnham said he that you are very much in the good graces of the little neapolitan oh no sir finer fellows than i 
am have all the chance there and for my part sir i don't much fancy her though she is lively and smart and when i get her by herself will tell the secrets of all the family which thou lovest to hear therefore get her by herself as soon as thou canst and make her tell thee all she knows willoughby then again tried to compose himself and by the help of the medicines he had taken obtained four or five hours sleep he was a great deal better in the morning as he breakfasted a note was brought him from lady castlenorth informing him that his uncle had been seized in the night with a violent return of that asthmatic complaint which so frequently had rendered his stay in england impossible that the spring though far advanced was so cold and wet that there was no chance of his being better while he remained there now and that therefore he had by the advice of his physicians and by his own inclination determined to set out that very day for the continent she added you will come to us of course instantly and if you cannot go with us settle when you will follow us but your uncle wishes you to accompany us this intelligence was to willoughby like a reprieve from what to him was worse than death since the longer he considered of his marriage the more dishonourable now and the more certainly miserable hereafter it appeared to him he wrote a hasty note saying how ill he had been the whole night and how impossible he feared it would be for him to see his uncle that day but that if his physician whom he every moment expected gave him leave to go out he would certainly wait upon him this answer had not been dispatched above an hour and his medical friend had just left him with a strict injunction not to stir out that day when lady castlenorth and mrs calder entered his room so my dear sir cried the former what is to be done lord castlenorth will be wretched to leave you behind and my poor girl too what is this sudden fever you really look ill i cannot imagine what is to be done for my lord to stay he thinks it death willoughby muttered something which he meant should express concern at his uncle's illness but mrs calder fortunately precluded the necessity of his being very distinct in his hypocrisy by stepping up to him and taking his hand come come said she let me feel your pulse she then gravely counting its vibrations as she held her stopwatch said why really now here is much less fever than i expected from your appearance let us see your tongue humph tis white to be sure where are your medicines i should think if you were well wrapped up and put into a chair you might go to your uncle without any danger on such an emergency you know a little may be hazarded no said lady castlenorth by no means nothing must be hazarded after all my lord may make himself easy as i dare say you will be able to overtake us before we get to paris where if my lord is better and finds that relief he generally does from a change of air we will stop till you join us i think you will be perfectly restored in a week but however i will go myself to dr b and hear what he says oh i can tell you interrupted mrs calder that he will be well perfectly well in less than a week i have been tasting his medicines and in understand clearly from them what dr b thinks of his fever i was a mere infirmus of that to be assured well said lady castlenorth my dear willoughby what shall we say 
Willoughby was ready to answer. Nothing more, good madame. But sighing from a sense of pain and restraint, he only replied that he could only say that he was very sorry for his uncle's illness, and that you will hasten after us? That, I think, I may venture to assure your uncle. He was settling this morning that you should be married in the English ambassador's chapel at Paris, and I really don't see myself that, upon the whole, these unlucky illnesses of my lord's and of yours need impede the affair a single hour. All the difference will be that you will be married at Paris instead of London, and we will pass the rest of the year in Italy instead of Castlenorth. But the dear young lady, cried Mrs. Calder, our sweet and lovely child, how will she bear even this transient separation? Indeed, I do not know, said Lady Castlenorth, affecting to be quite sympathetic. But she shall come and bring the letter my lord will have directed to be written with his last directions about the deeds and carriages, which our dear George must bring with him, and, added she, smiling, I fancy upon the footing they are now, there will be no great decorum in her coming to his lodgings. Willoughby found immediately his fever returning, and that he should have a terrible headache. He put up his hand to his temples. I am obliged to your ladyship, said he in a languid voice, and I wish this most oppressive headache of mine would. What, it aches now, does it? said Mrs. Calder. I wish Dr. B. was here. I am sure I could give him a hint or two on this case, which might be of use to him. Let us go to him, interrupted Lady Castlenorth and talk to him about this ugly fever, and when we have found him, it will be time to return to my lord and to send my daughter hither, for we think to sleep at Rochester to-night. Willoughby, now blessing her for her haste, made his compliments in a low voice, and still complaining of his head, the ladies departed. They were no sooner gone then he tried to discover by what means he might best avoid receiving the favour of the visit Lady Castlenorth had promised him from her daughter. He was ashamed of the part he was acting, however ill and reluctantly he performed it. For the first time in his life his conduct was contrary to his sense of honour, and he was conscious although unworthy of him, and while he had thus betrayed himself, he was become the dupe of Lady Castlenorth, and perhaps was meant to be the dupe of Miss Fitzhaman and their mutual favourite. His pride, as well as his rectitude, revolted from the idea of carrying on this odious farce, which he now wondered what demon had tempted him in the moment of passion and despair to begin, and which he, however late, thought he should now act more honourably in ending at once than in suffering it to proceed another day. He was, however, by no means able to determine at once how he should do this, and what he had most immediately to consider was— how he should escape the inquiry and ado of the heiress, which he might now every moment expect. He at great length determined to go to bed, and sending again for his physician, who was very much his friend, acknowledged the truth to him, and got an absolute prohibition against his seeing anybody. He told Farnham, therefore, that he again felt himself extremely ill, and bade him immediately run for Dr. B. Fortunately he met him in the next street, and in less than ten minutes he had received Willoughby's confession, that all his illness, both before and since his return from abroad, 
has been owing to distress of mind which he could now no longer hope would abate by the necessity he had thought of putting himself under to conceal it in short he owed that his dislike to miss fitzhaman as a wife was unconquerable and that he was determined at all events to break the treaty off however far it had gone and therefore entreated his friend to find some reason for his evading an interview so useless and so irksome when it was impossible for him to continue acting a moment longer the part he had so rashly undertaken and yet did not mean and especially in the present condition of his uncle's health abruptly and rudely to it to end it but to soften at least to him a disappointment which he had thus rendered doubly heavy dr b entered at once into his meaning and smiling said it is a little unusual my friend for me to contrive an illness to separate a lady from her lover though i have been often asked to make pretences for bringing them together however the fact is that you really are unfit to entertain the lady for your fever is considerably increased since i saw you this morning and we see very plainly that any agitation is hazardous while you continue in this irritable state i will therefore wait here and see miss fitzhaman myself and so contrive as to bring you off this time and for the future you must manage it yourself i am sure you despise me doctor cried willoughby for the part i have acted in this cursed affair no answered he not exactly so but i own i think you wrong inasmuch as any kind of dissimulation is unworthy of you and above all that which goes to rob a young woman of her heart under false pretenses but i hope i have not done that for upon my honour i should never forgive myself if i had it looks very like it though my friend from your own account of the matter and if it is so you think i ought at all events to marry her indeed i do alas my dear sir said willoughby it is surely better for me even more honourable to decline her hand now than to accept it and make her miserable i don't believe you could make any woman miserable answered dr b because you have good nature honour and generosity but my dear sir i do not mean to play the causist in such an affair and here if i am not mistaken is the lady herself at the door dear doctor cried willoughby have the goodness to go down directly he immediately obeyed and returning in a few moments said well i have sent away the disconsolate fair one broken-hearted for fear of losing her love don't rally me my friend answered willoughby but tell me did my cousin appear very much concerned she endeavoured at least to appear so do you think it was a mere endeavour would you not be mortified now if i said it seemed so to me no upon my honour i might perhaps be mortified to find that i was believed to be an easy subject of imposition but for the rest nothing would be a greater relief to me than to be well assured that the partiality my cousin shrewd for me was either never real or having been so exists no longer i don't know her enough replied dr b nor have i been long enough talking to her now to be a very good judge the honestness of them my friend are not easily understood and i am much mistaken if your fair relation comes under that description i mean when i say honestness the most candid the most sincere well but what do you judge 
from her behavior just now are miss fitzhaman's sentiments towards me she would have me believe i think that they are those of great attachment and trembling apprehension for your health but somehow it was i fancied a sort of concern that had more stage effect for its object than real concern ever thinks about and i do believe that if you do prove a perjured swain after all the heiress of castle north will not add to the sorrowful catalogue of damsels who have died for love willoughby glad to hear this now readily promised a ready acquiescence with his friend's orders which were to keep his mind as quiet as he could and to see nobody till he had quite conquered his remaining indisposition and the doctor then took his leave in less than two hours a large packet came to him from lord castlenorth which willoughby sent word down to the man who brought it that he was then too ill to open on farnham's delivering this message the servant said that no answer then was required for that his lord and lady their daughter mrs calder and captain Kavanagh, had all departed with the servants who were immediately about them the very moment he came away and were then in two post coaches and four on their way to rochester willoughby felt for a moment as much relieved by this intelligence as if half his troubles had been removed by their departure too soon however this temporary respite ended by his recollecting how much he must yet encounter before he could feel himself free and that whatever freedom he might regain celestina would be another's end of volume four chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c